welcome to Drum Roll. I'm Annabelle Drum, and with me today I've got a bassoon player who is one of the best networkers that I know. He did his studies at Victoria College of the Arts and Queensland Conservatorium. Uh, he was the first ever bassoonist to be awarded the prestigious Friedman Classical Fellowship and has appeared in Melbourne and Darwin Symphony Orchestras, the Melbourne Chamber and Orchestra Victoria. He's toured China several times with the Royal Melbourne Philharmonic, performed all across Europe, Russia, Norway, New York and England. And he's a founding member of the Arcadia Winds Ensemble, who were Musica Viva's inaugural Future Makers musicians. I'd like to welcome Matthew Neal. Hey, Matthew. Hi, Annabelle. How are you going? Very good. Nice to have you here with me. Now, I know that you were part of the Ensemble Francais. I understand that you have also been um, out traveling doing a solo tour lately. Yes, I have, Annabelle. Uh, I was just overseas in um, France and Germany, as well as New York um, City, uh, as part of the 2017 fellowship, uh, Friedman Fellowship that I won. Uh, I did this solo tour and I was playing a lot of Australian music over there. So there was a work by Holly Harrison called Airbender, which was a bassoon and string quartet work that I took off tour. And I also performed a work um, called New Roads, Old Destinations 2 that was written by Stuart Greenbaum on um, for piano and bassoon. And then, of course, I performed two staple works of the instrument, which was the Tarnsman Sonatine for bassoon and piano, as well as the saint Son Bassoon Sonata. And wow. so I was able to go all over the place and perform those works, and it was a fantastic experience. That's great exposure for the Australian composers too, because otherwise there's not really any other way that they'd get their music into those venues. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really good because when I was in Germany, I was specifically at the Mannheim um, School of Music there, and because they heard this music, uh, a lot of them actually want to perform those works That's for their right. recitals coming up in the next two years. So more exposure for the composers, more exposure of bassoon music. I think it's really good for everybody. Yes. Well, good on you for championing those <laughs> those pieces. <laughs> so now I guess the thing that's on everyone's mind at the moment is the whole COVID event and how uh, that has really changed the landscape, really put a... Uh, a stick in the spokes, you might say, of the industry for entertainment industry in the wheel. Um, how have you found that it's uh, changed things? So I know you had a huge amount of dates la laid out in your calendar. You're very, very good. This is what I said. You are a good networker. You're great at filling up your calendar with all sorts of interesting jobs. Um, how do you feel it's changed for the broader industry in stopping all these theatre performances? Yeah, um, I'd like to mention a couple of things about it. Um, for instance, uh, my colleagues and artists, whatever they do, um, they've been incredible over the last 12 months, given that Australia's had terrible bushfires um, that happened and a lot of them came out of the woodwork to help these people out. Um, you can tell that many artists are really, really generous. Um, and given these COVID times, it's been a real, real struggle um, for anybody that's been doing arts in Australia. And we, and myself in particular, really feel uh, for our colleagues. Um, so it's been really, really tough, let, let's be honest. However, um, there's been a shining light, um, especially for chamber musicians in this country. We're very fortunate to have the tools that we have, like Zoom or any sort of recording things on iPads, where you can sync up videos, get people to record together and create music to promote what we do um, and to really share it with everybody because interestingly enough during these COVID times what have people turn to they've turned to their TVs and they've turned to their phones where they can listen to all this different type of music and what better platforms that we have like Facebook Instagram where we can really showcase our art in the way it is so it's really revolutionizing the way that we do things. You've been really great at building those videos because I've seen uh, more of yours, I think, than anybody else. Being able to get those little chamber groups together and share the work, it's great promotion. You know, it also keeps people's exposure up. See, otherwise, I'm thinking when you go out and do a theatre show, you've got mm. a name for the ensemble and maybe that name has just been put together for that particular group, for that, you know, tour mm. or something um other times they are, they groups are well known but people don't necessarily remember who the individuals are within the group 
So by having all these little videos that you guys are putting out, you can go, well, who's that pianist? And who's that guy over there? And I think it's been very, very good in that way. Oh, thank you, Annabelle. It really means a lot. Um, I know that there's been an excessive amount of videos that I've created. Um, throughout <laughs> You're very good at it. Um, uh, thank you. It's, it's very kind. Um, but the main emphasis of why I did that wasn't just for my own profile, but to give Australian artists, especially classical musicians, the chance to be able to perform during these times. Um, it, it's really hard. Um, there's not many opportunities. And I've just been in contact with many colleagues and friends that I value very much and wanted to give them just four minutes or five minutes of exposure um, mm. to spread the music through there. And everybody's really partaken and have been generous with their time and donated their time to be able to do this. Hence why I think it's been really popular because everybody has the same goal and it's to just share what we do, why we do it, how we do it, and it's really influential. Um, and you end up with a bigger audience, right? You get an audience that's worldwide, not just local. Oh, it's been incredible. I mean, I've put out this month so far 13 videos, right? And we've had just on Facebook itself over 15,500 views for those 13 videos, which is something that's very unprecedented in chamber music, given the fact that you normally can only fit 150 to 200 in a venue that's intimate like that. It's not the same as performing live. And I also understand that my social media friends, they might get sick of seeing videos like this because they want to see live performance. However, it just this is it at the obvious. moment, right? Yeah, but it just states the obvious that, like, we're doing what we can. We're trying to give people the closest thing to live performance as possible so that when they go back, they'll appreciate it even more. And I, we're I just seeing that. Yeah, I agree with you. Now, there have been a few places where there have been sort of hubs of uh, digital concerts, and one of them, the, one of the first that I reckon got set up was the Melbourne Digital Concert Hall. I, I think that was brilliant that they got that started really fast. They, they moved it quickly and now they've got their website, which is full of concerts coming up. What advantages do you see for um, your audience members to be able to use a hub like that one? I actually performed with Arcadia Winds in the very, very first concert of Yay! the Melbourne Visual. <laughs> um, so I helped launch this. Chris Howlett and Adele Schoenhardt got in touch with us and they really wanted us to help launch this. So the first musical content that they had in this platform was a wind chamber ensemble. We were on board straight away because we saw the potential of this. Firstly, it gave us exposure, but it also meant that many musicians in this country will now have the chance to at least perform once or twice in this year that they weren't expecting to after COVID happened. I mean, it's just an absolutely, for me, a no-brainer. So are you Just going into a theatre to record those concerts? Yes. Yeah, so um, Greg Hocking has been a huge inspiration for all of us. He's lent the Athenaeum Theatre free of charge um, and he's been able to like basically say to the government that I've closed the whole place down deliberately so that this can happen. It's just an incredible gesture and it really showcases why music can survive in this country when you have people like that donating their time in this space. And so um, the advantages then uh, for people looking in on a digital channel, first of all, they could stay home in their jammies. Absolutely. But then second of all, they're still able to get a live experience which is the whole point, isn't it? And I mean, what's going to happen now with all these rules that are changing is that they're going to start incorporating little audiences within the digital concert hall to be able to go and see. So then you're going to have both experiences, which I think will even enhance that meeting. I'll have to clap really loud. <laughs> and I think that, that, that there's a special connection there, isn't there, with a live performance. Like, you can pre-record stuff and people go, yeah, yeah, I've seen that could have been last year. But if they know that they're tuning in to a concert that's happening right now, there's something, um, there, there is a connection there. And even for you guys as performers, even if you can't necessarily see your audience, you can feel, because like for me, doing radio, I can't see any of my audience, but I can feel that there's a connection there, you know? And, uh, and that's, that could be something interesting for you guys as well, I suppose, while you're doing your performance. Yeah, well, you know, the thing is, right, Annabelle, why do audiences go and see what they want to see? Because they want to see how groups, actors, musicians, anybody in the performing arts react with each other. 
So the beauty of actually seeing things happen spontaneously because something might have gone wrong or something has gone better than they expected, that's what they go and see, isn't it? And, and so risk with as the, well, right? <laughs> There's risk involved. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's the thing what you miss from when you do these recordings sometimes is that because it's recorded and then you're splicing it together, that lack of spontaneity isn't there. And audiences can see that. They're not stupid. And that's why this concert hall aspect with Melbourne Digital Concert Hall, with Melbourne University's Melbourne series, which is going to go digital as well, M Live at Monash University. I mean, Melbourne is really doing a great job with their online entertainment. So let's have a look at the, uh, the dates as well. So you've got your concert coming up. This is with a trio ensemble. Friday 5th of June at 8.30pm. That's going to be live Melbourne time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in winter now, so I suppose it's the same for Queensland as well. So tell us a little bit about the music, just briefly. I really wanted to showcase the full length and our version of uh, Percy Granger. We always believe in having an Australian composer, even though he's Australian English. We wanted to promote works that were in the Romantic period. So Henry Brod was a, actually a phenomenal oboist himself. So we thought it would be great to have something like that. And the Freedomen, it's a very interesting piece. So it's very chilled out, very dance-like. Estalge Plauda sort of is this aspect of marital courting at that time. So you can imagine it's a little bit R-rated, the, um, the title. But it's very enjoyable, it's very lyrical, and it's great to have another work from that era. It's a bit of fun. Mm. You know, we haven't had much fun during COVID, and I wanted our audience to actually feel a little bit of joy, have a bit of a giggle with the programming, but really showcase the beauty and the happiness that these instruments can bring. Fantastic. Well, I think it's going to be a lovely concert. I'll put the links in below this video. It's going to be at the Melbourne Digital Concert Hall this Friday. So you've got nothing to do. You can be there Friday at 8.30 p.m. And the tickets are $24 per device. That means that if you've got a nice big computer screen, you want the family to snuggle up around the screen and watch the concert, then you're only buying one ticket. But of course you can donate, I'm, I'm assuming, and buy as many tickets as you want because uh, any way that you can help support our musicians uh, in the time of need when they helped so much through the Australian bushfires at the beginning of the year and end of last year, I think would be a lovely piece of karma and way that you can help out and support the musicians. Thank you so much, Matthew, for joining me today. All right then, see you around. Thank you.